Okay, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8 this morning. We're going to continue talking about healing. And um, you should take notes if you haven't had this teaching before. Or take notes anyways. This is good stuff. You, be, you need to be able to show people in the scriptures why you believe what you believe. Uh, if anybody is a Christian, they shouldn't believe the Bible is the Word of God because that's what their salvation is based on. Um, it's based on the sacrifice of Jesus, but that's in the Bible, isn't it? Uh, I know a lot of Christians that think this is old-fashioned, it's outdated, it's not good for today, like God has changed his moral standards or something or the way he does something. I am the Lord thy God, I change not. He is God. He is always faithful even when we're not. So this is what we can give our life to, the word of God. God is not a man that anyone should call him a liar. This is truth, and if we're not living this, we're living a lie. And um, we have to really always keep an open heart to learn more. We've got to be like little children. How come this, Dad? Why this, Daddy? Why does this work like this? What do you think of this, Daddy? I used to be that way when I first got saved because I didn't know nothing, and the Lord would just keep teaching me and teaching me. But in, when you are talking with people, majority of people, majority of Christians, even pastors, will believe that God heals, but they're not having any miracles. It's almost like they have stopped teaching it or never did because they don't know what to do if God doesn't answer prayer and then they don't know why he doesn't answer prayer. Then the people get upset instead of having the hassle with all of that and having the people argue with each other of why God this and why God that. It's easier not to teach about it and just have good worship and let the church grow. But see, this puts demands on our life. But it's supposed to so that we can get to know God better through faith. And um, deliverance isn't taught at all in churches. Prophecy isn't taught anymore because there's so many different theories that the pastors don't know what to teach. And then there's always people that believe different, so they don't want to teach one theory because some people might get upset and leave. That's how childish the body of Christ is. I mean, just believe it or don't believe it. Judge for yourself. Judge the word according to the word of God. We have to seek the word for ourselves. We have, to, we have the Holy Spirit within us. We've got to get more sensitive to God and the ways of God. This is why we keep te teaching kingdom and kingdom principles. Work them into your life. And through that process, you get to know God better. Um, this morning, I was teaching in our home, our Sunday morning church, on um, spiritual warfare and how involved it is and how many different levels it is and that we are in a personal spiritual battle every day of our lives, our thought life. Are our thoughts lining up with the word of God? Are the thoughts coming from the evil in our hearts or from the devil or the sinful nature? Um, casting down imaginations and all thoughts that do not line up with the Word of God, the Bible says. So we have to know the Word of God. We have to understand how the negative spiritual kingdom functions and works. And we have to understand that we have God's protection. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can endure. And we should count it all joy when we fall into trials and temptations of many kinds because it's the testing of our faith, which demands perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work. So all these things is how God works. But every good and perfect gift is from above. God doesn't put sickness on us. That is a doctrine of demons, I believe. <laughs> every good and perfect gift comes from God. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit, and with power, who went about doing good healing, all that we are oppressed of the devil. God is good, the devil is bad. The first thing we have to learn when we go to Bible school. First thing we should learn as a Christian, and always remember that. In God, there's no variableness of turning. He doesn't heal you one day and make you sick the next day. 
It's just not God. So God is very definite about his blood covenant, about the sacrifice of Jesus, what he's done for us, what he's given to us. It's very definite in the word. And if people don't understand that, then they start to get confused. That's why we keep teaching. That's why we taught what we did last week on Acts chapter 3, where it says very specifically in the word of God that it belongs to us. We are the heirs because we are in Christ. We are the heir. It was promised to Abraham and to the heir, to his heir, meaning singular, meaning Jesus. We are in Christ, so we are the heirs. So we shouldn't be surprised that all of this is available for us today. We should be excited. Hallelujah. So today we're going to continue on with this concept of healing and health in Christ. So why does God heal? Number one, to fulfill prophecy, Matthew 8 and 17. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove them out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick, all of them. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. So here in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16 and 17, the Holy Spirit, through Matthew, inspiring Matthew, is teaching us what Jesus accomplished on the cross in Isaiah 54 or 53 and verse 4. So he's fulfilling prophecy because in Isaiah 53 verse 4 is about Jesus on the cross. He carried our griefs and our sorrows, the King James Bible says. King James Bible was translated by people under King James who started his own denomination because everybody was still Catholic and he wanted divorce and the Pope wouldn't grant him one, so he started his own religion, he started the Anglican Church. And so these were the people, he interpreted the Bible, and these were the people that interpreted the Bible at that time. Well, they certainly didn't know the healing power of God. They didn't understand blood covenant. They were just healing and interpreting the words that they were reading in, in Greek and then translating them into English. But the Greek words had a bigger variety of meanings than our English words. Our English language is very... Um, we need more words, but in the Greek language, one word can mean like deliverance, means complete and total deliverance from all evil. And that's the word zozo. And um, so it, the, the English words have much more meaning, or the Greek words. So when they read the Greek word, they would just interpret the Greek word according to their understanding of what that scripture meant. So they never put down in Isaiah 53 that Jesus carried away our sickness and diseases. You see what the problem is. And so everybody says, oh, you got to read the King James. Well, you got to read everything, but you got to listen to the Holy Spirit. When you get to know God well enough, the Holy Spirit will tell you what it says, no matter what translation you have. All right. So he's the teacher. And here is the interpretation by the Holy Spirit of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And that in Isaiah 53, well, let's just turn there for a moment. We have gotta go there sooner or later anyway, so we'll do it right now. Isaiah 53 is prophetic of what Jesus is gonna go through on the cro cross. It says, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Um, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. That is physical healing, emotional healing, every kind of healing that you would need. Um, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. The King James, I believe says, took up our griefs and carried our sorrows. Or it talks about griefs and sorrows. But if you look up those words in the Old Testament in different scriptures, they actually come across sickness and diseases. And we see in the Old Testament, we are in a new and better covenant. In the Old Covenant under Abraham, God brought the people out of Egypt. There was none sickly among them. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. Their shoes and their clothes did not wear out. That's the same God we still serve today. 
Do we think we have a better situation under the new covenant or a worse situation under the new covenant than they had under the old covenant? The old covenant wasn't sufficient. That's why Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant. And so these words here should have been interpreted are sicknesses and diseases and casting out demons because this is what he did, our infirmities and carried our diseases. So Jesus did that to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. So I don't know how anyone can argue with this. Jesus is casting out demons and healing the sick to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Wow. And that is the prophecy about Jesus carrying our sickness, diseases, our sins, and all of that there. So here is definite proof from the Bible that nobody can really argue with because they have to change the Bible. And you don't want to do that because then you get in trouble with God. Yeah. All right. Second reason he heals is to destroy the works of the evil one. Acts 10 and 38. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the evil one. And so Jesus was healing all the people that the devil was making sick. The devil is bad, God is good. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus came to bring life, and that more abundant. Um, because of his compassion to show his love, Matthew 14 and 14. Uh, we'll just turn over there. We're not too far from there. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 14. Uh, when Jesus heard, I'm going to start verse 13, what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. What he heard was that John the Baptist had been beheaded. John the Baptist was his cousin in the natural realm. Hearing of this, the crowds, so he, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowd followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. The devil incited Herod and his stepdaughter to behead John the Baptist. It really came from the devil. Kingdom of darkness, murder comes from the kingdom of darkness, the devil. How did Jesus get back at the devil? He went and healed. He had compassion and healed all the sick. When I get mad at the devil, I just start teaching more and preaching more and praying for people more. I mean, that's, that's how you fight this spiritual battle. There's going to be a lot of people going to be ticked off when they find out what's been going on in the world. They're going to be all set and they're going to be angry. They want to go and attack their presidents or prime ministers or whatever they happen to have. That's not the answer for Christians. We attack the devil. He's the one that caused it all. They're responsible, and they'll get their judgment. They'll get their just reward. But we don't get mad at them. We get mad at the devil. And to get even with the devil, we just go get more people saved, more people healed, more people baptized. That's what ticks him off. So don't mess with us, devil, because we'll get mad and go do more for Jesus. Amen? See, we got to think spiritually. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, wickedness in heavenly places, and not against flesh and blood. Because really, it's the negative spiritual realm that is controlling all these negative things. When we were talking about um, last week, Sunday morning, I was talking about spiritual warfare and that there's a hierarchy in the spiritual realm principalities, powers, and rulers in, in heavenly places. And when you break that all down, those words all mean different things. The darkness of this present world. There's levels. There's the devil who's preeminent. Then there's the fallen angels who are over nations. And when uh, Gabriel bring, came to bring the answer to Daniel that he was praying for, it took him 21 days to get through. He was fighting with the prince over Persia. That was a fallen angel. And uh, when he got, when he said when he went to go back, he'd have to fight again over, with the prince over Greece. But Michael, the archangel, came to help him. 
and when we look at Daniel chapter 12, Michael the archangel is the angel who is designated to look over the nation of Israel. And so we have evil spirits, fallen angels over nations. We have principalities and powers over cities and over territories and so forth. And then down at this level where we are uh, and, and over governments. So these evil, wicked spirits and powers in the negative spiritual realm have a job to do and that's to lead the whole world astray. And that's what they've been doing and they've done a good job of it because they're gonna find out just how wicked and evil. It's, it's you know, it, it so mirrors what is happening today behind the scenes. As you all know what's going on, or most of you do. And when this is all revealed, people are gonna be really upset that they were lied to by the media and that their government was lying to them and all these other things. But that's where we're gonna to have to talk to people calm them down, show them what the real problem is. And if you want to get even, then turn to Jesus because it's your last chance before things get even worse in the last days. And so this is how we have to deal with these things. Get them to get mad at the devil. He's the one that's causing it all. All right, testify to the resurrection of the Lord, Acts 4 and 33. Um, People were healed to give a testimony to the resurrection of the Lord. Peter says that in Acts chapter 3, that Jesus was raised from the dead, and it's faith in him that this man was healed. To honor his covenant. We talked about that Acts chapter 3 last week. That's all to honor his covenant, his blood covenant. He swore by himself to keep that covenant to Abraham and to the seed. So God swore to you over four, three and a half, four thousand years ago. He gave his word, he swore by himself to you, to Abraham and to you, that this is for you today. This blood covenant is a holy, sacred covenant because it is established by the blood of Jesus. I don't know about you, but that thrills me every time I think of that. When, when Jesus stood up at the last supper, every time we have communion, this is my blood in the new covenant. I've been teaching and studying this for years and my heart just goes berserk. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Wow, my blood of the new covenant. There's many Christians that don't even understand what a blood covenant is. To draw people to truth, let's turn to John chapter 14. Jesus did miracles to draw people to the truth. Um, while we're going over there, let's stop in Mark chapter 16, to confirm his word. We'll start in verse 15, Mark chapter 16. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news of creation, to, or good news to all creation. He said, all authority has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. In other words, I am telling you to go. I'm giving you the authority to go in my name. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will fully accompany those who believe. Doesn't say the evangelist, doesn't say the pastor, the, those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snake with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. They will get well. Will is a very definite word here. Not, they will lay hands on sick people and I might heal them if I'm in a good mood. It's not what he says, is it? They will get well, but you have to believe that you've received. We're gonna talk a lot of things about healing and why some people don't receive and, and a lot of those kind of things. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. The signs that accompanied what? His word, his word on healing, that he heals today. Many churches just don't teach on healing. 
even if they believe it's for today because if people aren't healed, then the people don't understand. The pastor doesn't know how to explain it. And after a while, then nobody has faith and nothing happens, so then they just quit praying. And then they change the theology because they can't be wrong and say, well, it's not for today. It was only for the early church. So they're trying to change the covenant, as we said last week. It's sort of like a, a slow downhill slide. And the whole gospel of healing, I mean, it's always been there. It was lost during the Dark Ages, primarily. And Martin Luther started the Protestant movement, but it was on justification by faith. They still didn't go far enough to believe in healing. But if they had justification by faith, they should have realized who they were in Christ and everything else. But they never went that far. And the Lutheran church, which came from that, is still baptizing infants instead of people making the decision for Jesus. All right? So we see, I believe this is what happens. We, if we don't teach this stuff, then no miracles are happening. No miracles are happening, we quit teaching. But Jesus accompanies his word. He certifies his word that it's true, but you have to teach healing. Or how can he confirm the word? All right? So, I mean, everybody's getting saved because people have been preaching about salvation for years, but then there's churches. There's different levels of spirituality in different denominations. But they started with a new revelation, but then they didn't go any farther. And many people came and they were busy looking after the people and they didn't go farther. So then God brought another revelation and another revelation. Then he brought the Azusa Street Revival in 1906, I think it was, or four. And that's where the whole Pentecostal movement came. But then they never, I mean, the things we were teaching now, they were teaching years ago, but then they sort of quit teaching that because they just, after a while, they get religious. I've had Pentecostal pastors, a friend of mine, that got a revelation of who he was in Christ. I said, didn't they teach you that in Bible school? Well, yeah, sort of, but we never really believed it. Well, <laughs> like, you know, if it's the Word of God and, and it's trust, I mean, how can you help people who have a negative self-image if you don't teach them who they are in Christ. You're just going to pat them on the head and tell them, oh, just trust God. God loves you. Well, that only goes so far. It doesn't make them feel any better. They need their own revelation. And they don't have no concept of righteousness by faith because they look at their own life and they feel unworthy. So how can they grow? How can they get to know Jesus? How can they express that to anyone? I mean, it's not going anywhere. This is why we're so adamant about teaching what we teach. All right, John chapter 14. And verse 11. I'm going to start in verse 9. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. The Father living in me who is doing his work by the Holy Spirit. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So, Jesus is doing miracles here to draw people to truth. They couldn't understand what he was saying because they didn't understand spiritual things. He said, well, then at least believe what I'm saying because of the miracles that are happening. See, there was a, a Roman centurion who came to Jesus and he said he had men under him and, and men over him. And what he says is, this one, go and do this, he does it. So, Lord, you don't have to come and heal my servant. Just say the words and he'll be healed. And Jesus said, I have not seen such great faith, no, not in all of Israel. What gave that centurion great faith? He understood the concept of authority. And he knew Jesus must be somebody really important. He said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. He knew these things were so supernatural, that the God of heaven was doing them through Jesus, so Jesus must have been really important. 
And so that's why he said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Just speak the word because I'm a man in authority and I'm under authority. There's a lesson for us. To be in authority, you need to be under authority, especially under the authority of Jesus, but also under authority of someone. Otherwise, you're a loose cannon, and the devil can play all kinds of games with you. Everybody has to be accountable to somebody, especially if you want a healing ministry, because God starts working to you. What happens? You get full of pride, and pride is self-deceptive. You don't even realize you're getting full of pride, but people around you will know and you need someone that's mature in the Lord, that knows you, knows your character, and loves you enough to tell you the truth, that you're getting a little bit prideful, and that comes out, will come out in your own speech, and your own talking. The evidence of the miracles themselves. So Jesus confirms his word. The gospel is confirmed by the miracles. That's why I said the other week that there are no prophets in Israel today doing miracles because they're done in the name of Jesus. The miracles follow the preaching of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so it's only in the name of Jesus that people are being healed by God. Wow, it's a privilege to be a Christian, isn't it? All right, John 15 and 24, to hold men accountable. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of their sins. But now that they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. There is a responsibility in the spiritual realm for having seen miracles. You cannot see a miracle. You've heard about miracles today. I know you guys are all okay, but you need to express this to people that you pray for and God heals. You need to take them to that scripture. And you need to express the fact that I didn't do this. Jesus did this. I can't heal anyone. It's faith in the name of Jesus. But if he's done a miracle, and you know it's Jesus because he's the only one that does the miracles, now you need to, now you know God is real, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to seek him? That's what he expects. Because if you don't, then what is going to get you to seek God? I mean, this is God showing his love to you. You didn't do anything to earn it. He just healed you when I prayed for you. He did it. He's showing his love. He's testifying, giving testimony to the gospel that it's true. I'm talking to you about Jesus. He's the one that healed you. Now what are you going to do about it? And if you don't do anything, then what is it going to take for you to respond to Jesus? He just did a miracle for you. The religious people wanted him to do a miracle, and he said he wouldn't do one for them because they would end up worse than what they were. Because he compared it to an evil spirit coming out of a man and going around seeking rest, comes back, finds the house empty and clean, and he brings back seven spirits worse than himself and goes and abides in that house. This is how it'll be with this religious generation or this generation that he was talking to at that time, the religious people. So he wouldn't do a miracle for them because it would only make them worse because he knew they wouldn't turn. So you have to express things like this to people when you pray for them and they receive a healing, especially if they're not Christians. And if they're Christians, then you, know, you have to take the next step. You have to make disciples because they might be disciples of a religious system or nothing. Maybe they just quit going to church. I find many times that pastors I've spoken to, they've gotten saved and then went, they, they wanted to serve God. They had a call in their life but they went to the denomination that they grew up in. Well, if you didn't get saved there and never experienced Jesus, why would you go back there? Why would you go to their schools? Like, you know, a lot of this just doesn't make any sense to me. But that's where they grew up. That's what they knew, so that's where they go back. They're going to serve God in their church. It's not your church. It's not even God's church. He can't even get in there. Like... It's like people don't connect the dots anymore. They don't think for themselves. I got saved and, and, and met Jesus and experienced him. I didn't go back to the Catholic Church to be a priest. My mom always wanted me to. But I thought, they lied to me. Why would I go back there? I want truth. And I wasn't going to believe what any man said unless the Holy Spirit showed me in the scriptures that it was truth because man had lied to me. 
I didn't trust anybody because I didn't know anything and I didn't know who to trust unless the Holy Spirit would teach it to me. Amen. I'm doing real good now. So it holds men accountable. To bring glory to the Father, John 14, 11 to 13. I want you to really start thinking for yourselves. I know you're doing that, but I'm just encouraging you to do more. I mean, connect the dots, think it through, because if you can't think it through and get it solid in your heart, the devil will run you around that mountain in the wilderness. And, or somebody else will say something. Did you ever believe something and somebody came and said something different than you started to wonder? Now, why is he saying that? Or why does he believe that? Did you ever, sometimes you question what you believe? Well, that's good, because then you get back in the scriptures and reassure yourself by the Holy Spirit that what you believe is right. And if you're really seeking truth, he will show you if you're not right. But it's hard once somebody believes something in their heart to change that, because they have to admit they were wrong all their life. I've talked to a, a pastor, a good friend of mine, and he was a good teacher, but I talked to him about healing and about the kingdom, and he preached about the kingdom, he said. He was a Dutch reform minister. And then I said some other things, and, he, and then he said to me, do you want me to believe that our tradition has been wrong for all these generations, he says? I said, I don't want you to do anything except read the Bible. What's your Bible tell you? But see, he was taught that way for generations, and he could not see what I was saying, and he could not believe that they had been duped all these years. Today I would tell him, well, you had some truth, but a lot of it was false, fake news about the kingdom. <laughs> It wasn't the whole truth. That wouldn't make him happy either, though, would it? I guess I just that way I get people upset with me because I speak the truth, but somebody has to. All right, where did we go? John chapter 14, verse 11. I'm going to find that here pretty soon. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Man, you preach the gospel, God does miracles. That should make a believer out of them. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. <laughs> wow. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Um, let's look back at John chapter 15. See, we have to take the whole counsel of God on every subject. Um, John chapter 15, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And so we have to remain in him. We want to remain in life. We have to live in him according to the principles of the kingdom that he taught. I am, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Nix. Ran. Zilch. Apart from Jesus. You cannot bring one iota of change in the kingdom of God. Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, only God who gives the increase. You cannot change yourself. You have to be dependent upon God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and do it his way. And he'll let you go your own way if you insist, but you'll get so frustrated until you finally give up and say, I can't do it, help Jesus. Okay, here I am. That's what Jesus will say. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask what you wish and it will be given you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. 
This is my, to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Bear much fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Bear much love. Bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. That's to the Father's glory. They should be able to see something different in you. They're supposed to know us by our love. And this is something we have to practice. We have to be determined we're going to love that miserable person at work. We're going to bring him a coffee and say nice things to him and about him. How can he get mad at you and give you a hard time if you do that? But what do we do? Our, our natural tendency in our heart is to badmouth him behind his back or say negative things to other people so other people won't like him either so that we're right and he's wrong or give him a hard time because he's giving us a hard time. See, that's the devil's way. The devil incites him and then he incites us against him and he's laughing because he's dividing us. It's that sacrificial love and prayer that will unite us and will melt their hearts so that they will accept Jesus. And then when you make a friend, you can pray for him. Then God can heal him. And then he can start to hear you what you got to say about Jesus because he was healed. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Wow. The kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. You want complete joy? Remain in him. Walk in him. Live in him. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, and he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. So here we have a level of servanthood, then we have a le level of friendship. Friend of Jesus. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my commandment, love each other. This is the proper biblical way. There are people that are going to be doing miracles and Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you because they weren't bearing fruit. They were just all excited about the power, but not Jesus. Didn't have a relationship with him. This is my command, love each other. So the emphasis is always developing your character in Jesus. The power will flow to that and it will keep you safe because you're strong in him, because you're bearing fruit, fruit of the spirit. So God honors faith and he always wants to heal people, so he'll use anybody to do it. But if you want to have a healing ministry, then you have to develop this character. Because that's the only thing that will keep you safe during the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's because we love the truth. Healing is part of that truth. But Jesus is the truth. All right, so why don't we see more miracles today? Because we don't clearly see God's provision. There's too many religious ideas that cause doubt and destroy faith. In Canada, we have a great governmental health plan. Affluent people think that they have no need for God. The poor and needy people are usually more open to receive from God. God wants to do miracles in every church. Jesus died so that his body, his church, and every church would say, oh, they're the church of Jesus Christ. Well, have you got signs and wonders following you? Are you bearing fruit or are you fighting and splitting up? Are you forgiving one another from the heart? Are you praying for one another? Are you studying the word? See, once a church breaks down and they lose their first love, they stop receiving revelation. And God has to raise up a whole new group of people with the next revelation. And 
as I said, the Reformation started in 1200s and the 1500s with Martin Luther, but it wasn't until early 1900s that there was a real outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Azusa Street, and now they say there's 750 million Pentecostal type people speaking in tongues all over the world. This is just in the last hundred years. Wow, that's amazing. And then slowly they became a church and they got away from divine healing. I've had old Pentecostal people, my car mechanic, he was 86 years old, still working on cars, and he'd talk to me and he'd, he'd sit there and cry sometimes. Oh, I remember the days when so-and-so who had a farm would come and give a testimony that God healed his cow. We don't hear any healings anymore, not even people, never mind cows. <laughs> So I told him the story about God healing all my pigs. So he was happy about that. God was still moving. But see, it slowly, you're dealing with people and they don't know how to, they're not teaching them, not making disciples. The people aren't growing, they aren't changing, they haven't any faith. They, they cry and whine when they're in trials and they come for prayer, make it better Jesus, make it better pastor, pray for me and nothing happens because it's a trial to grow their faith in Jesus, but they don't have been taught about faith and determination and all of those kind of things. And then they just sort of say, well, just trust God, God bless you, son, away you go. I mean, that's the most religious cliche I have heard, just trust God. Well, teach them how to trust God. You're the teacher, you're the pastor, teach them something that they can work into their life and how to work it into their heart. Otherwise, it's just another story. See, this has to be practical so it changes our lives. And then slowly, the people don't have any faith. There's no miracles happening. Or people go up for prayer and the people don't understand things about healing and the way God works. And because they have such a negative self-image, they don't know who they are in Christ, they can't receive, they have no faith pastors and teaching on healing anymore because no miracles were happening. Other people aren't coming up because they didn't see any miracles happening. There's not an atmosphere as miracles. There's not an atmosphere as faith. And pretty soon, they're still teaching the gospel. People are still getting saved, but they're not bearing the fruit they should. And they are gotten to the point where they still believe in the power of God, but they're not having miracles because they're not teaching it. Does everybody know churches like that? They probably came out of churches like that. And it just, that's what I call, it becomes a religious system. That's why we gotta get back to kingdom and teaching kingdom and everything that God has for us. So there's a lot of religious ideas and God made me sick to teach me something or this is my cross to bear. I've heard good people Good Christians, we would call good Christians. They go to church every Sunday, serve God, and they mean well, but they haven't been taught the truth. And so they'll say, well, this is my cross to bear. Oh, Jesus didn't bear it for you. See, they don't believe that healing is part of the covenant. Healing is part of the atonement because it hasn't been taught. All they have to do is read Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17, and that's their proof right there. This is why I'm teaching this way because you'll run across people like this. So this is what you have to tell them. You have to show them in the word what the Bible says. And then pray for them. And when they're healed, ask them what they're going to do now about Jesus. You have to challenge them a little bit, depending on the relationship you have with them and so forth. But if Jesus healed them, that means he's okay with them. So now you've got to get them hooked up with Jesus somehow. All right? So these are all, we're teaching these things so that you can, it's not just about having miracles happen through you, it's about the whole picture, making disciples, it's about everything. And so if all you want is miracles and God using you, well, this isn't the place for you because God will use you, but if you don't want to listen to the other teaching on the heart and getting our act together a barren fruit, then you're going to be in bad shape when the power really gets released and God pours out his spirit. 
I'm saying these things because I love you, not to give you a hard time. Amen. One amen. All right. Somebody agrees with me. All right, okay. So uh, we talked about Isaiah 53 and 4. Surely he has uh, uh, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Griefs in the other Old Testament scriptures translated sickness and disease. And they have to see that deliverance and healing go together. And that healing is part of the blood covenant, which Matthew 8 and 16 and 17 proves. Plus, we proved that last week with Acts chapter 3 and that whole scenario there. Um, so they have to see, they have to understand what a blood covenant is and that healing is part of the blood covenant. And the blood covenant is a sacred covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant. It's established by the very death of Jesus. Healing. Blood covenant. By his stripes we were healed. We must understand the covenant principles of sacredness, ownership, and life. Last week we talked about Hebrews 6, 13, and 20, the surety of the covenant where God swore by himself so that we could be greatly encouraged. God swore by himself. I wasn't going to believe what any man had to say, but when God swears by himself, and he's not a man that he should lie, now I can believe it. I can give my life. I could leave my farm, my future for my children and myself, and being a multimillionaire, I could leave all of that to serve God because he swore by himself. I didn't know what he was going to do with me or how he was going to do it, but he said go, so I went. Because... He told me to. Um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 for a moment. And if you want to get serious about all this, it's good to read chapter 9 and 10 of Hebrews because it's all about the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus went into the most holy place once for all by his own blood. Because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. All right, now let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. This is all because of the blood of Jesus. Verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. Now, people get confused about this. Sometimes people keep on sinning because they haven't grown yet. You have to have patience. You have to teach them. You have to make disciples. You have to teach them how to bear the fruit of the Spirit. You have to tell them how the kingdom works. They're not, they don't want to sin. They just can't help sinning because they haven't grown enough to get set free. And if God sets them free instantly, then they'll just go back to their sin. So he wants them to grow so they can keep their freedom. And so you have to take this in proper context with the individual, what situation he's in. Some people get under such condemnation from some of these scriptures because they're still sinning and they haven't got the victory. It's as long as you're still coming to Jesus and you're spending time in the word and doing the homework I give you to do, meditate on who you are in Christ and righteousness by faith, listen to the teaching on the heart, work out your salvation, God will give you the victory. Just stick with it, don't quit. Same as the prodigal son. So we deliberately keep on sinning. So this is, we know the truth. We're not babies. We know the truth, but we deliberately keep on sinning because we just want to. I don't care how many miracles Jesus has done in my life. I'm going to go live what I do, what I want to do. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment of the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Wow. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. In the Old Testament, that's the way it was. See, the Old Testament is important because we see God's attitude towards sin and his judgment. We're under grace now, but God still feels the same way towards sin. It's just that he wants us to, he gives us every opportunity to grow in him. He's always there. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you all things that belong to life and godliness. 
how much more severely. So we had two or three witnesses that somebody was counted guilty. They died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. They were put to death. See, there is death involved one way or another in a blood covenant. When men made blood covenants with each other, if they didn't keep the covenant, their own family would have to kill them or they could never make another covenant with any other tribe or any other person because they didn't keep the covenant. And death was the penalty of the covenant. That's how sacred it was. It was the most powerful type of agreement that could be made. And Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? See, somebody who's lived with God, knows God, and then willfully keeps on sinning. Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know it is him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That should keep the fear of God in our lives. But I want to go back to what he said here. To be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot. In other words, you understand the sacrifice of Jesus, what's about, you've accepted him, you've experienced him, and then you just willfully keep on sinning. It's like trampling Jesus underfoot, just walking over his sacrifice, that it has absolutely no meaning. See, the devil's supposed to be under our feet, not Jesus. We can't treat him like we treat the devil. But just walk right over him. I mean, has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant. The blood of the covenant is sacred. It's holy. Don't treat it as an unholy thing because it's the blood of the covenant. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant. That covenant is a blood covenant established by the very blood of Jesus. Don't treat it as an unholy thing. This is why when we have communion, we have to judge our hearts. Paul said, if you don't judge yourself, then you can come under judgment of the Lord. This is why many of you are sick and dying. Every time you have communion, it is sacred and holy. It represents the blood of Jesus, which is holy because it has sanctified you. It has declared that you are holy for the rest of your life. But God wants you to be holy. He wants you to purify your heart. But we have this privilege of being accounted as righteousness because we believe in the sacred blood of Jesus Christ. So communion is a very, very serious thing before God. And if we take that as just a common tradition, or it's not a big deal, everybody else say, yeah, we'll have communion today, yeah, okay. You know, have a hunk of bread and some juice. And we had communion, we love you, Jesus. But if you don't, if you're coming and realize how holy the blood is, and it's what's made you holy, and you don't judge your heart, you're treating it as common, not for what it really is. And if you treat it for what it really is, now you start getting the understanding of faith and a blood covenant and that healing is part of that blood covenant. So you got people that want healing, but they're walking in unforgiveness in the church and they want healing from God. They're making themselves sick and they want healing from God by not honoring the holiness of communion and the blood covenant that declared them holy. You see how we get religious and get this stuff all mixed up? I know, I've been in a lot of churches, but I never heard that teaching in church. Oh, let's just have communion. The Catholics have it every day. They don't have a clue what it's about. Just tradition. Don't ever let it become an ordinary thing. In our church, we usually do it once a month. We don't want it to become a tradition, but you can have communion every morning with your Lord. But realize my heart still goes, like I say, berserk when we have communion because those words of Jesus, this is my blood of the new covenant. I know what a covenant is. I know what it means to be de declared holy, even though the way I've lived my life in the past. I know what it's like to be used of God 
to heal the sick and, and amazing miracles that have happened throughout our ministry. So when he said, and it's all because of that blood covenant. See, and most Christians, a lot of Christians, they don't even know what a blood covenant is. They don't even know what communion represents other than that Jesus died and rose again. And who has insulted the spirit of grace. So we take communion and we have unforgiveness in our heart or we have sin in our heart and we don't repent of it. And we're just, see, we're trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. We're, we're just saying, ah, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm still doing this and doing that, but it's a no big deal. And, and I'm going to take communion. It's like trampling underfoot the blood of Christ, Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, everything that he's done for us as an unimportant thing. People that do that have no concept of righteousness by faith in their heart. They have no concept of anything. See, that's why we don't have more miracles. Because we're a blessed nation. Church has got sloppy with teaching about the kingdom. This is the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. And it's a slow deterioration that happens over years. And God raises up, God has raised up the charismatic now. We're not, most charismatics are not part of the denomination. Um, I belong to an organization of independent churches. I'm accountable to a pastor that sponsored me. He was actually the leader. And he's traveled with me, he went to Ethiopia with me. And so I'm accountable to him. In other words, he can speak into my life at any time. Because I know him, I respect his integrity, and I know he will tell me the truth and not just say things to make me feel good when I've been wrong. That's the kind of person you need in your life, somebody that will speak into your life because they love you. The same as you would talk to your children's because you don't want to see them going down the wrong road. You discipline them because you want them to be good citizens of the kingdom and of the world. All right, let's look at Ephesians chapter one. We'll go a few more minutes here. I know most of you agree with all of this and you understand all of this, but it's good to realize your responsibility of this in, in ministering healing to others. That it's not just that God used you, but the responsibility that comes with being a minister of the gospel. And you are all ministers. We're here to prepare you to be ministers of the gospel. So I'm saying all this extra stuff because I recognize it as an awesome responsibility to do everything God's way. Because if I don't, I suffer the consequences or my family suffers the consequences. God doesn't play church. He's full of grace and love and mercy. But the bottom line, this is what he goes by. And he doesn't always bring his judgment, but in the end, we're gonna get exactly what we deserve. So the more that we can do it his way, the better off we're gonna be. Ephesians 1, verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. A revelation in our heart, not the eyes of our head, but the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly realms. That you may know the hope to which he has called you, the rich of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power, that we would get a revelation of it, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is for us who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. I don't care what your heart says, if you believe in this, you're good to go. I don't care if you have a negative self, and we pray for people anyways. After a while, you start feeling better about yourself. Oh, God does use me. I am worth something. But just don't get full of pride. When we, we have negative self-image, we need to be lifted up in our high position in Christ Jesus. 
But people who have a high position in the world need to have pride in their low position because they should know that their life is as the flower of the fields. It's here today and gone tomorrow. This is why Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because he is prideful in his own resources to make himself rich. He doesn't realize it was God that did it anyways. The principles of God's kingdom. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given. And this is what we have in Christ. We're seated in Christ. Verse 3 of chapter 1. Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We have already been blessed. This already belongs to us. It's already ours because we believe in Jesus and his shed blood. You have a signed contract for the house you own or the car you own when you bought it. You paid it off. You have documents from the bank that you paid it off. It's a contract. It now belongs to you. If somebody comes and steals it, you call the police and they find them and arrest that man. It belongs to you. Because we believe in Jesus, all this belongs to us. Healing belongs to you. You don't have to beg God for it. You have to have some faith and believe what he's done for you already, that he wants to heal you. He wants to bless you. That's our Heavenly Father. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him. But He wants us to grow up, too. We have been predestined to be changed into the image of His Son. But all of this power, all of this, see it with Jesus, it's already been given to us. You have to get a revelation of that and then live from a position of victory in Christ. And from that position, I don't keep the law, I fulfill the law by the grace of God and walking in love and serving Jesus and serving people. Now you're on the right track and the devil can't mess with you because anytime you need anything or you need wisdom, you ask God for wisdom and he will give you wisdom. And you keep living for him and you keep praying for people. The anointing will get stronger and stronger and he can trust you more. Jesus was given the spirit without measure. None of us have that because we could not handle that kind of power. And every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Is everything is under his feet, and we are the body of Christ, and it's under our feet, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And we're going to read one more scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18 to 20. But surely as God is faithful. Is God faithful? Amen. Our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy was not yes and no. But in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ Jesus. And so through him, the amen is spoken by all of us to the glory of God. So in Christ Jesus, it's not, well, sometimes God heals and sometimes he makes us sick. It's not yes and no, it's always yes. This is what Jesus died for. Is God willing to heal? He was willing to die. He established a blood covenant when he died. God swore by himself to keep that covenant. How can we think he's not willing to heal? See, all of these negative things cause doubt in our heart. But if you understand this properly and have a revelation of it, it will eliminate the doubt. And even if there is doubt, you can still believe that you have received 
It's just that you haven't grown in that degree of faith yet, but you can function in that degree of faith because your faith is in the Word of God. It's not in your feelings. You see that difference? You got to think that way. You got to incorporate that thinking into your life, and you got to live that way. You got to be bound and determined. From this day forward, you're going to start loving people. You're going to forgive everybody from your heart. From your heart, not just lip service. And you're going to meditate on the word and get a deeper revelation of righteousness by faith and who you are in Christ. You're going to understand the blood covenant if you don't. We have teaching on it. Just go on the website. Under, you have to understand these things because the Holy Spirit connects them all together, which makes it so powerful a concept that every time you read the Bible, it comes alive to you. You know, I don't make notes on all this stuff. I just get up here and start talking, and it just comes to me because I've been doing this for so many years, and I just say things that the Holy Spirit is putting in my mind. One time I was teaching, and I was talking and, and listening to what I was saying. I wasn't even thinking of what I was saying. I was just saying it. And I was thinking to myself, man, that's good stuff. I should be taking notes. In the middle of what I'm saying, I'm thinking that way. Like usually you think of what you're saying. But I'm a teacher, and so the Lord anoints me to teach, and this stuff just starts coming to me, and I just start teaching. And I'll tell a story, and it's for someone in the congregation that is going through that, and they needed to hear that, and they get healed or they get set free. One time I just taught on faith and trusting and believing God, just like I'm teaching now. And there was a woman in Ethiopia sitting in the, in the, in the auditorium at the time, and I didn't have time to pray for the sick because it was time to go for lunch. And I never prayed for anybody. But she went home, and on the way home, she was healed. She had been in pain for 16 years in her uterus. She had an issue of blood. The church had been praying for her for 16 years. I never even laid hands on her. I just taught on faith. And on the way home, she was healed. And the pastor was so amazed. And everybody was amazed because nobody even prayed for her. The pa pastor did. We've been, he came to me shaking and said, we prayed for her for 16 years. You come and teach a sermon and she's healed. Everybody you talk to, everybody you pray for is healed. Uh, I don't think everybody was healed, but he said that's the way he thought of it. No matter where I went, he'd get people and get them to come over and I'd pray for them because he thought everybody would heal if I prayed for him. Well, there's more to healing than that, but I prayed anyways. But she was healed just because she heard the word. And... It must have released a blockage in her heart of something or other. Maybe she didn't feel worthy or whatever, but it released something and God just healed her. But he does those kind of things with an apostolic ministry because he confirms his word. All right, Psalm 103 says, God forgives all of our sins and heals all of your diseases. All sins, all diseases. This comes back to the teaching I did on the absoluteness of the cross, absolute righteousness, absolute restoration, absolute redemption, absolute trust in the cross, absolute healing. When I pray for people now, I say, Lord, we want absolute healing here. But he's in charge, not me. I have a testimony too, and I'll end with that. Uh, Sunday night when we got home, Kathy had such pain in her hands. She had some arthritis in her hands that the joints were so painful. She was almost crying, she couldn't sleep. I got mad finally. I mean, I prayed for her every day, but I got mad and got up and said, stand up and give me your hands. And I commanded that pain to leave in Jesus' name. And I was praying like I was mad. I was mad at the devil, mad at that pain. I was mad at seeing, watching Kathy suffer. And she said, it just, my voice got hoarse. I couldn't even pray anymore. I was praying for about five minutes, but after preaching and being tired, it doesn't take long. I'm starting to lose my voice now, as you can tell. But for about five minutes, I just got mad and prayed and prayed in Jesus' name, absolute healing. And the pain went down 50%, so she was able to get to sleep. And I said, well, why is this happening? She says, I don't know. So I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, show Kathy why this is happening. I don't know these things. I don't know what she's going through. I don't know what she's done or what she hasn't done. 
I don't mean sin or anything. The next day she realized that she had taken this, she had to go to the hospital and she had a certain treatment to keep her breast cancer away. And it was after that that it really got painful, really got bad where she couldn't stand the pain. And so when she went off her, she takes a certain medication for keeping the breast cancer away. Plus she had the special treatment, so she went off that medication and now her hand is getting better. It's back to where it was. I says, when you get it back to where it was before, well, she's gonna stay off the medication for a couple of weeks just to see whether this gives her, it's a side effect from them. And this medicine they give us, it, all of it has side effects. And so you wanna stay away from her and you can, but I mean, if your life is endangered and yeah, go to the doctor, take medicine. We're not against any of that. But once she gets back to normal and she gets off that medication, get us out of her system and there's still pain left, then I'm gonna get mad at that every day and we're gonna keep taking authority over it until it is gone. She's getting to the point where she doesn't wanna live and she has to live in this kind of pain. It's no quality of life. Well, then miles ago off your medicine and die of something, but don't die of the medicine they're giving you, <laughs> you know. You know, but I can't make these choices for her. That's her decision. But I'll stand by her and agree 100%. But I get mad when I see Kathy suffering when all she's done is sacrifice her whole life for people. And, you know, sometimes we don't realize we just sort of get used to this or get used to that or take a pill for this or take a pill for that. But once in a while, you just got to get mad at it <laughs> and get serious about this absoluteness of the cross and just get definite about it. That's the way we have to be with deliverance too. You know, just devil, your demons, you're coming out because I'm gonna torment you with the name of Jesus until you do and I ain't quitting. I don't care if I have to do that two hours a day, four days in a row. It's just I can't do that anymore. So I'm teaching you guys, but it's just getting real definite and serious. The kingdom of God suffers violent and violent men lay hold of it. So you gotta fight for what belongs to you. Don't let the devil steal it from you. That's what's happening. He's stealing it from you. He's stealing your healing. The doctors are saying this and don't believe the doctors. Go find out what's wrong and then you know how to pray. The doctor doesn't have the final word. I'm gonna have Kathy give some testimonies about how she got ticked off at the doctor. She, you know, she had this problem. I won't share it with you, I'll let her share it. But the doctor told her, you'd be back in three months, beg or three weeks begging me for this operation. So he got ticked off at the doctor, but really she got ticked off at the devil because the doctor didn't really know any better. But she suffered for a few months, but the Lord healed her. But she had to stick with it. See, it's how much time are we spending with God? How much time are we spending in his presence? How much do we trust him? All of these things are variables in our faith. So we're trying to get you really in a solid, faith position here. This belongs to you. This is not a battle between you and God for healing. This is a battle between you and the devil. And you're in charge through Jesus Christ. That is the mentality you must have if you're gonna fight some of the sickness and disease. I've never had to believe God for healing very much because I've always been healthy until I had my heart operation. I remember trying to walk around the hospital before I came home. It was only five days I was there. I said, oh Lord, I really need healing now. <laughs> You've got to get me through this somehow because I am not done yet. <laughs> and I recovered very really quickly. But it was the only time I really had to believe God for healing. But I understand faith and all these principles. And so this is why we keep teaching them. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. Thank you that they're all part of the blood covenant and that it was established by the blood of Jesus, which is sacred and it's a sacred covenant and you swore by yourself, Father. And there's absolute righteousness, absolute healing provided in that sacrifice, Lord. You forgave all of our sins and heal all of our diseases. Father, help us and remind us by the Holy Spirit, bring these things back to our remembrance that we would think in terms of absolute, that we can Fight this battle against the kingdom of darkness from a position of victory because you've already given us the victory. We just have to discipline ourselves in your word and in faith to get the victory. 
and we must persevere because perseverance has a work to do so that we can change our character and grow in faith and learn to trust you and develop all these different relationships with you that we need, Father. So thank you for this awesome plan. Thank you for giving us the wisdom to understand your plan and how this all works in the spiritual realm. Father, we pray for those that belong to you, that are called by your name, Lord Jesus. Lord, that they would be woken up to the reality of the kingdom, the reality of your sacrifice, the absoluteness of your sacrifice, that it involved everything. Everything has already been given to us. It already belongs to us. And we thank you for this, Father. We give you all the praise and honor and glory, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.